This is Quantum Field Theory 5. Welcome. In this video, we will consider some results from classical electrodynamics that play a direct role in, or have counterparts in, quantum electrodynamics. First up is the phenomenon of the electron self-force, which is intimately connected with the structure of the electron. At the end of his seminal 1932 paper, Fermi wrote, In conclusion, we may therefore say that practically all the problems in radiation theory which do not involve the structure of the electron have their satisfactory explanation, while the problems connected with the internal properties of the electron are still very far from their solution. These problems took the form of troubling infinities that kept showing up in calculations and seemed to threaten the very foundations of quantum field theory for years to come. Let's start by asking, what does an electron look like? We know it has a certain mass and carries a certain amount of electric charge. By symmetry, we might guess it's a sphere of some radius r, with the charge uniformly distributed throughout its volume. Or, since like charges repel, maybe the charge is concentrated in a spherical shell of radius r, such as happens when a conducting sphere is charged. In any case, if the electron is a distribution of electric charge, the pieces should exert forces on each other. Consider any two patches on the surface of the shell model. These charges will exert equal magnitude but oppositely directed forces on each other. While the net force on the entire electron is zero, each patch of the surface will feel a radial force trying to push it off to infinity. This immediately raises the question, what holds the pieces together? And, if the pieces are held together by forces in equilibrium, then can they vibrate? That is, can the electron be excited into various oscillation modes? Along the same lines, can we add or subtract pieces? Can we form a half-electron? The modern response to these types of questions seems to have been first put forward by Frankel in 1925. The electron is elementary and has no substructure. Now, what geometric object has no substructure? A point. So the electron is a point particle, a point charge. We will discuss some of the reasons for this conclusion later. For now, Let's continue thinking about the possible substructure of the electron. Analyzing a spherical distribution of charge leads to difficult calculations. We will instead look at a toy problem, a dumbbell electron, consisting of two parts, separated by distance d along the z-axis. Each part is a half-electron, a point mass with charge q, half of the total electron charge. Part 1 creates an electric field E1. The electron charge is negative, but we will treat it as positive since then the electric field points in the same direction as the resulting force. Our final result will depend only on the square of the charge, so it won't matter whether it's positive or negative. Part 2 creates an electric field E2. At the positions of the other parts, these fields have equal magnitude, but opposite direction. Therefore, while each part will feel a force of repulsion trying to tear the electron apart, there is no net force on the electron as a whole. If we move to the right of part 1, we are moving closer to part 2, so field E2 is stronger. If we move to the right of part 2, we are moving farther from part 1, so field E1 is weaker. Now, imagine the fields are produced by the charges at their original positions, Z1R and Z2R. 
Then, without changing the fields, the charges are moved rightward to positions Z1 and Z2. Assume each part only sees the field produced by the other part. The result would be that part 1 would feel a stronger force toward the left than part 2 would feel toward the right. And there would be a net leftward force on the entire electron. Could such a process occur? Well, imagine the distance d is one light second, roughly the distance between Earth and Moon. The electron has been at rest for a long time, with the pieces at positions Z1R and Z2R, what we call the retarded positions. Then the electron starts moving to the right. As the charges move, the fields they produce will change. However, these changes do not occur instantaneously throughout space, but propagate at the speed of light. So for about a second, the field E1, seen by part 2, and the field E2, seen by part 1, will continue to be those produced at the retarded positions. And this net force process will indeed occur. This will be true for any finite value of d, although the time scale will scale accordingly. This is the same phenomenon that leads us to say that the stars we see in the sky appear not as they are now, but as they were in the past, when the light entering our eyes was emitted. So each piece of an electron sees the other pieces, not as they are now, but as they were some very short time in the past. This is the source of the electron self-force. If the electric field magnitude is charge over distance squared, and if each part has charge Q, E1 is Q over Z2 minus Z1R squared. And E2 is minus Q over Z1 minus Z2R squared. The minus sign indicates the field points to the left in the minus Z direction. According to electromagnetic theory, if the charges were in motion when the fields were produced, the field magnitudes are modified by the velocity factors shown here, where V1R and V2R are the velocities of the parts when they were at the retarded positions Z1R and Z2R. Notice that if the electron had been moving to the right, so both velocities are positive, the V1R factor will increase the magnitude of E1, and the V2R factor will decrease the magnitude of E2. If we use units in which the speed of light is 1, then a distance such as Z2 minus Z1R equals the time it takes light to travel that distance, call it tau1. So, we replace the distances squared in the denominators with time squared, tau1 squared, and tau2 squared. Let's call z of t the position of the center of the electron. With z at time 0 equal to 0. Then part 1 is located at z1 equals z of t minus r, where the radius r is half of the diameter d. And part 2 is located at z2 equals z of t plus r. The trajectories of the two parts are identical curves, offset vertically by d. At time t, part 2 will see the field produced by part 1 at a time tau1 in the past. The corresponding distance, z2 of t minus z1 of t minus tau1, equals the time delay tau1. We can understand this graphically using our trajectory curves. In our units, the speed of light is 1. So starting at a point on the z2 curve, we travel back and down at a slope of 1, an angle of 45 degrees, until we hit the z1 curve. The horizontal offset is tau1. The vertical offset is z2 of t minus z1 of t minus tau1. Substituting the z1 and z2 expressions, we have tau1 equals d plus z of t minus z of t minus tau1. At a time t, part 1 will see the field produced by part 2 at a time tau2 in the past. 
the corresponding distance, z2 of t minus tau2 minus z1 of t, equals the time delay tau2. Starting at a point on the z1 curve, we travel back and up at 45 degrees until we hit the z2 curve. The horizontal offset is tau2. The vertical offset is z2 of t minus tau2 minus z1 of t. And we find tau2 equals d plus z of t minus tau2 minus z of t. For simplicity, let's take t equals zero. Then tau1 equals d minus z of minus tau1, and tau2 equals d plus z of minus tau2. Let's evaluate the self-force for the case of uniform motion, z of t equals vt. Our tau expression reads tau1 equals d plus v tau1, and tau2 equals d minus v tau2. We can solve these for tau1 equals d over 1 minus v, and tau2 equals d over 1 plus v. Substituting this into our expression for E1 and canceling a common factor of 1 minus v, we get Q over D squared times 1 minus v squared. For E2, we get minus Q over D squared 1 minus v squared. Since E1 plus E2 equals 0, there is no self-force in this case. This is great news because it's required by special relativity, according to which there is no physical way to establish an absolute state of motion. If there was an electron self-force which varied with velocity relative to some reference frame, then that frame could be taken to represent absolute rest in violation of special relativity. Constant velocity produces no self-force. But let's look at constant acceleration. Z of t equals one-half a t squared. The time derivative of this is the instantaneous velocity v of t equals a t. Our tau expressions now read tau1 equals d minus one-half a tau1 squared, and tau2 equals d plus one-half a tau2 squared. And our electric field expressions are E1 equals Q over tau1 squared, 1 plus minus a tau1 over 1 minus minus a tau1. E2 equals minus Q over tau2 squared, 1 minus minus a tau2 over 1 plus minus a tau2. We will do the calculations using the open source computer algebra system Maxima. We solve the tau equations iteratively to sufficient accuracy for our purposes. First set tau1 equal to d, then substitute this value into the equation tau1 equals d minus one half a tau1 squared. Do the same for tau2. Then calculate the fields e1 and e2 and finally compute the net force F equals QE1 plus QE2. This is a messy expression, but we can have the computer expand the expression for F in a so-called Taylor series in the variable D about the value D equals zero and up to the minus one power of D. The result is minus two AQ squared over D plus terms and higher powers of D. Writing 1 over r in place of 2 over d, the self-force for an accelerating dumbbell electron is minus q squared over r times a. Due to the r in the denominator, if we let r go to zero, corresponding to the dumbbell electron collapsing to a single point charge, the self-force becomes minus infinity times a, an infinite force that opposes acceleration. So, 
no point charge could ever accelerate. Obviously, charged particles can accelerate, so apparently we can rule out the existence of point charges 